Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Backpacking Light podcast, where we discuss the philosophy and skills of lightweight backcountry travel so you can experience the outdoors with more comfort, safety, and enjoyment. I'm Ryan Jordan. And I'm Andrew Marshall. And today's podcast is a skills short about cold-related diseases. So a lot of the country is in full-on winter. Ryan, I know you've got feet of snow out there in Wyoming. We've got feet of snow up here in the Sierra. Not to mention temperatures are dropping all over the place, but that's no reason not to get out there and have some adventures with the right skills and mindset and gear. Winter camping can be a ton of fun. We are already experiencing temperatures down into the single digits up here. I live at about 7,200 feet, so uh, most of the places where I hike are you know, eight, nine, 10,000 right now. And uh, it is winter out here. It's very exciting. So before we get started, we should say that neither of us is a medical professional. We can give you some tips here, but please do your own training. A basic first aid class is a must for anyone who wants to spend time adventuring in the outdoors. With that said, let's dive in. So today we'll be talking chiefly about frostbite and hypothermia. And Ryan, I find these really fascinating because there's such a range of symptoms that each of them has. Uh, but let's start with frostbite. Well, I'll I'll start with an anecdote here. So my first experience with frostbite, I grew up in Washington State. And so uh, you don't have extreme cold on the coastal states like you do in the Rocky Mountains here. So my first experience with frostbite was on a uh, backcountry ski expedition in the Canadian Rockies. We were traversing the Columbia ice field. And we got caught up on the ice field with um, a cold front that brought temperatures that were well below zero and high winds and blizzard conditions. And so we were uh, between huts and exposed for a night and um, experienced some extraordinarily cold conditions with wind wind chills down into the uh, 30 to 40 below range. And about, there was about 10 of us in the party and over half experienced frostbite of some type. Um, one of the, uh, participants in our expedition ended up having to be evacuated by helicopter because her, her feet were frostbitten so badly, but, you know, even I experienced frost nip on my nose and tips of my bottom tips of my ears. And most of my fingers had some degree of minor to superficial frostbite. So it can be a, a, an experience that sneaks up on you and it's it's kind of scary and extraordinarily painful. Yeah, so what actually is frostbite uh, if we think about it medically and scientifically? Well, think of it most simply as the freezing of the outer layer of skin and its underlying tissues. And the more severe it is, the more severe the underlying tissues freeze. And when we talk about freezing, we're talking about two two things that are happening here, which are actually quite different. The first is that intercellular fluid freezes. Here we're talking about the fluid between the cells that delivers nutrients to the cell. So circulation. So your circulation slows down because this fluid freezes and you can no longer deliver nutrients to your cells. The other aspect is that the intracellular fluid freezes. This is the fluid inside the actual cell. And And here, when this happens, cell function just shuts down. So the combination of these two things, if it happens for a long period of time, results in cell death. And as cells start to die, then your tissues start to die. And as your tissues start to die, then um, you're progressing into a more severe form of frostbite where tissue recovery is not going to happen. And isn't there some sort of phenomenon where the the ice crystals inside of the cells will rupture the cell wall? That's exactly right. And and so if you think of um, an ice cube as it as water freezes, it expands, right? And so you get the formation of ice crystals in this little tiny living thing that we call a cell, and it can it can damage cell walls or it can rupture um, other other things inside the cell as well, like organelles and and other structures that are such an important part of cell function. Right. And one example I like to give people is this is why when you freeze something like strawberries and then take them out of the freezer and defrost them, they turn into a pile of mush, basically, because they've just (laughs) been destroyed from the inside. That's exactly right. So that's what's happening at the cellular level. But how does this manifest itself symptomatically? Well, 
let's start with frostnip. Okay, so this is the very early stage of mild frostbite, and basically all frostnip is is pain and tingling that you feel, especially as your skin warms. So most commonly, you realize this in camp after you've settled in, get in your sleeping bag, in your tent, and you're starting to warm up, and your your tissues are kind of thawing out from the day. And so I I most recognize this on my nose because it is the part of my body that is covered the least amount of time throughout a day. And so I'm going to get in my tent, get warmed up, and then I'll feel this pain and tingling on the tip of my nose. And that's a sure case that you have started the process of uh, freezing skin. And, and that, so that's frostnip, right? As frostbite progresses, we separate it into two categories. One is superficial frostbite and one is deep frostbite. In superficial frostbite, you've got skin that has now progressed from red to pale or even white. And this is caused by, you know, freezing of the um, in- intercellular fluid. And so circulation goes down and we no longer have our nice pink red skin that, that indicates healthy skin. Another symptom of superficial frostbite is that the skin can feel warm. And I'm not talking about while you're rewarming it, I'm talking about like when it's when you're out and exposed into this area and you can feel this sensation of warmth in your skin. And so to me, that's a huge warning sign that frostbite is starting to affect my sensory system and I'm feeling warmth in my skin that isn't really there. And that's caused by a combination of freezing of the tissues combined with uh, your nervous system. So then you get in, get in your tent at night then you're starting to warm. And as your frozen tissues warm, you feel this stinging and burning. And especially with fingers and toes, you experience swelling. And this is what I experienced up in the Canadian Rockies when my fingers were frostbitten is my fingers really swelled up. Like I had no definition in my knuckles or anything. It was really kind of a spooky, Mm -hmm. spooky experience. And then even in superficial frostbite, um, you you end up seeing kind of mottled skin, so it it's kind of this white and red patchy skin that's um, it just it doesn't look normal, doesn't look healthy, and in more severe cases of um, superficial frostbite, you can get blistering of the skin as your tissues rewarm. So now let's talk about. Uh, when we talk about frostbite, we always think of like Everest climbers and their black skin. So that's that's what we call deep frostbite, right? In deep frostbite, your skin actually turns white or gray, and often it has a bluish tinge to it. And this is again while you're while you're exposed. Um, this is before rewarming happens. What are some scenarios that are particularly uh, let's call it good at creating frostbite. Like what, what should we be aware of? I think the most important one is wind combined with extreme cold. So if you have wind, what you're, what's happening is that wind is rushing across your layer of exposed skin and minimizing the thickness of what we call this insulating boundary layer at the skin surface, which is this little tiny um, thickness of, of heat that helps insulate you. And as your body loses heat, it loses it to the environment, obviously. But the, in the presence of wind, the, that heat loss increases dramatically. And so that little tiny boundary layer next to your skin goes away. And now the surface of your skin is no longer... Uh, warm. It is it is exposed to extreme cold temperatures, and so that's probably you know extreme cold wind and then whatever skin you have exposed. Now most of us are covered up in the winter, head to toe, with the exception of usually our face and maybe the bottoms of our ears as they uh, peek down through a hat. And then as wind comes up, we put on goggles and balaclavas and things like that. But the the bottom line is that you you have to deal with exposed skin first, and then you have to deal with insulation as the temperature drops. So moving from gloves to mittens or adding an overboot to your system and things like that. 
All right. So let's say you've got frostbite. How, what's the best way to treat minor frostbite? Well, I think the most important thing is to protect your skin from further exposure. So you you have to get out of the environment that is causing the frostbite in the first place. And if that means getting into your tent or in a shelter of some type so that you can get out of the wind and the and the cold, that's number one. Um, the, the second thing you can do in the absence of that is to add more insulation. So if you feel your hands starting to get numb while you're wearing um, even insulated gloves on a ski trip, for example, you probably want to add a mitten over that so that you can uh, provide a buffer of, of insulation that prevents further heat loss from your hands. Now that may not uh, be sufficient to reverse the feeling of numbness or whatever you have in your hand, and you might need to add an external heat source like a hand warmer or something like that to that. But the the critical thing is to rewarm your tissues slowly. And so um, I always caution people to be very careful with external heat sources because mm. um, if you rewarm your tissues too fast, it can cause substantially more pain. So just keep that in mind. I'm not a huge fan of like putting your hands in warm water that you've heated up on your stove because the result can be this really intense pain. And if you rewarm your tissues too fast, it can cause some t- tissue damage. One strategy for rewarming hands is to rewarm them in lukewarm water, but it's literally got to be lukewarm water. And it's difficult for someone to self-administer this because chances are their sensation in their fingers is not very good. And so they don't know how warm or cool or lukewarm the water actually is. And oftentimes they will heat that water up too high and uh, because they don't realize how warm it is. So I always encourage people to do that in the presence of a partner so your partner can provide um, some guidance on, on what lukewarm really means. So again, just to reiterate here, we're protecting our skin from further exposure. We're adding insulation. We're getting out of the elements and we're rewarming our tissues slowly, being very careful with external heat sources. How, how much of those techniques apply to severe frostbite? Or, or if you have severe frostbite, should you just worry about just evacuating yourself and, and deal with it later? Yeah, so in severe frostbite, rewarming tissues in the field will incapacitate the victim and you have no choice but to evac and get medical attention as soon as possible. Don't try to rewarm in the field and just get the person out of there. Okay, so that is frostbite. So let's move on to hypothermia. And we'll do this in the same structure. So we'll start with uh, what is hypothermia medically and scientifically? Very simply, hypothermia is a drop in the body's core temperature. That's it. And how does this manifest? We like to talk about what we call the the umbles. And the umbles are these this series of terms that rhymes with umble, and there's stumbles, fumbles, mumbles, and grumbles. Stumbles is the loss of gross motor skills. So someone obviously stumb- stumbling around as they're hiking would be an example of this. The fumbles are a loss of fine motor skills and reaction time uh, goes, goes down. So if you're trying to tie a knot or you're, you're trying to open a, a packet of peanut butter or whatever, and you're having a difficult time doing that, that's, that's often a, a manifestation of hypothermia as well, at least mild hypothermia. Mumbles are when you're talking to a victim and they um, aren't able to string together sentences or pronounce words properly, or, you know, as hypothermia becomes more severe, they can even become incoherent where you can't understand anything they're saying. And then the grumbles, which is a change in behavior or attitude. And often as people's body temperature drops, their, their brain function is going to be compromised and you'll see significant changes in behavior that's often manifested as um, irritability. And so that's why we call it the grumbles. And then the other symptoms that are kind of important to watch for are intense shivering. Shivering is your body's response to a drop in body temperature. And it's not a bad thing because shivering allows your body to generate a little bit of heat 
But the moment you see one of your party members start to shiver, um, the sooner you can address that, the the better it is and the the less risk you'll have of that person uh, decaying into more severe hypothermia. If you observe a person who has been shivering violently and then they stop shivering and start to get drowsy, then you've progressed into a, a pretty serious situation and, and you have to address it accordingly. Man, it seems like these umbles are hard to differentiate between hypothermia and just maybe someone who's uh, just exhausted at the end of a long day. Is there any way to tell the difference between the two? The difference between hypothermic-related umbles and exhaustion-related umbles is that once a person comes to rest and gets a little food or drink in them, um, if they're exhausted, they tend to recover quickly, at least physically and emotionally. And someone who has hypothermia uh, they recover less quickly. And so that's, that's kind of one of the, uh, the telltale signs. So just keep in mind that like getting into camp late at the end of the day after an exhausting day is, is one thing, but we've all experienced this, right? Where we stop what we're doing for 30 minutes and rest and cook some food and get in our tents and our morale goes up and, and we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're back at, back in action and hypothermia that doesn't happen. All right. So when should we be looking out for hypothermia? I think there might be somewhat of a misconception that you have to be, you know, standing in knee deep snow to be looking out for hypothermia. No. And in fact, the most common hypothermic situations are during the summer. And that's because people are prepared for warm temperatures and they're not prepared when cold, wet, windy conditions come and they might be riding a fine line between preparedness and risk. So you could be talking about something like it's July, you're above tree line in the in the Rockies, and suddenly a storm comes in, soaks you, and then the temperature drops. Those are the most common situations where I've seen hypothermia in, for example, our guided trekking program. The other common scenario is in the fringe season where you know that things can get bad and you might be prepared for it, but you prepare too late. So for example, crossing a high pass in a fall storm that's starting to drop snow late in the day. And we have this uh, memory of summer warmth. And so we might not have dressed warm enough to, to cross over that pass. And we end up uh, getting caught by dropping temperatures and high winds and and uh, your body temperature drops as a result of not being adequately uh, clothed. Are there any other scenarios that may be even less obvious? Yeah, I think three to look out for include slow hiking. So if you're hiking very slow or you're in a group where there's slow hikers, you can't generate the body heat, right? So as a guide, I know one of the things I always take on any trip is extra insulation to uh, stay warm while moving slow. Because if I'm not able to generate body heat and there's hikers with me who are slow because of fitness issues or anything like that, I want to make sure that I'm maintaining my core temperature adequately. So in a group trip, I will often take extra clothing with me to compensate for that. The other thing is hiking late in the day in a storm. So once that sun goes down, uh, temperatures drop dramatically, especially in the winter. And I think to mitigate that, you just plan ahead a little bit so that there's plenty of daylight uh, when you get into camp so that you're not experiencing this um, situation where you're coming into a, into camp uh, freezing cold and then you have all these camp chores to do in the evening anyways. And then this third situation, and this is probably the most common situation I've experienced is, you know, we hike all day long and then uh, we get into camp, we stop moving and we don't um, put on our insulation quick enough. And so Mm -hmm. our, our body temperature is now no longer being maintained by activity and we're losing dramatic amounts of heat. It's late in the day and temperatures have dropped. Maybe the weather's getting bad and we still have to like hang out cook dinner or whatever. And so to me, that's like, that's a really critical time, especially in bad weather to keep an eye out for your group. 
Yeah, you got to throw that puffy on as soon as you stop walking. Yeah, you bet. So we've talked a little bit about this, um, but let's just as a summary, how can someone prevent hypothermia from occurring? Well, I think the biggest thing is to minimize moisture next to your skin. And again, the scenario is coming into camp after you've been hiking hard and you have a damp base layer on. So that as long as that base layer is damp and temperatures are dropping, you're going to lose a pretty significant amount of body heat just through conduction because of the water next to your skin. So if you're arriving into camp with a wet base layer, uh, get out of that, you know, and get some dry clothes next to your skin. That, that can go a long way at um, improving your comfort as you uh, become sedentary in camp for the rest of the night. The second thing is make sure you pack lots of insulation and ultralight backpackers are kind of famous for what's the lightest down jacket I can take on my trip. Well, here's the way I'd like you to, to pose that question. What's the lightest down jacket that will keep me warm when conditions get really, really bad or really cold, mm -hmm. the coldest temperatures I'm expecting and add wind to that and things like that. And there's a tenet of ultralight backpacking philosophy that says, okay, if it gets that cold, I'm going to get into my sleeping bag on my shelter, which is a good plan. But if that's not part of your overall strategy and you know you're going to have to be exposed at night cooking dinner or whatever, make sure you have enough insulation to be comfortable in the lowest temperatures that you're expecting. And then the final thing is minimize your exposure to the wind. To me, the wind is the most dangerous part of this triad of cold, wet, and wind. And if you take out the wind, um, it's much easier to manage things. So if you know you're going to be camping in a windy environment and you're above the tree line in the mountains and there's there's enough cold and wet weather risk that hypothermia is going to be a real issue for you, maybe choose a shelter that gives you more protection from the wind. It seems to me that management and prevention is really, really crucial for this disease because... Uh, it's famously difficult to self-diagnose once you are already in the cycle of hypothermia. Yeah, I'd agree. And that comes with the your your brain function going down and, and feeling confused or disoriented about what's going on. It's, it is a difficult thing to self-diagnose. How should someone treat minor hypothermia? Um, my, if you're below the tree line, my favorite method is to build a raging big fire and get everybody around it. It's, it provides some psychological cheer for everybody, but also that external heat can go a long way at reversing someone who is decaying into minor hypothermia. Other than that, the kind of the fundamental process is get out of wet clothes and get into dry clothes, add a bunch of insulation, start drinking warm drinks or soups get in a tent so you're out of the wind and use some external heat like a hot water bottle or cuddling up with a, a tent partner or something like that so that 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 heat can be shared between you and um, external heat obviously like a fire or hot water bottle can be used to help warm your body if someone is violently shivering one of my favorite techniques is the use of what we call a burrito wrap where you take a person um, in a sleeping bag and in a tent and you wrap them up in a in a tarp or a ground cloth or you know some way to create this vapor barrier effect all the way around the sleeping bag now before people scream about condensation and <laughs> <laughs> because if you leave a person in there overnight, their their sleeping bag is going to be soaked and unusable. It does not take very long to warm somebody up doing this. Um, we're talking 15 to 30 minutes. It has a huge impact on someone's ability to get warm. And, you know, once they're warm, then you can obviously take the vapor barrier off and you're good to go. And you, you've not accumulated any moisture in your sleeping bag. What about someone in the throes of severe hypothermia? So now we're talking about uh, someone who's stopped shivering and maybe losing consciousness. And the biggest thing is to uh, monitor their breathing and heart rate. And if their heart stops, you uh, apply CPR. And it's, it's not an uncommon way for a hypothermia victim to degrade when they're 
you know, to see their heart stop beating. So that's, that's kind of fundamental. And by the time someone has progressed to this point, you can forget about field management. It's evac and medical assistance right away. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do any rapid rewarming with these victims either, correct? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's the idea that warm water immersion, which we talked about a little bit in frostbite, um, also can help with hypothermia. By the time someone's body temperature has dropped several degrees, uh, applying any kind of water immersion can cause heart arrhythmia and heart failure. So you've got to be really cautious there. All right. Are there any other cold-related diseases we're missing? I can think of maybe cold water immersion foot. We've already covered that in a previous podcast. What else is out there? Yeah, I think one of the one of the things to be aware of, and especially this is especially true in the spring and fall when temperatures are cooler, but the ground and the surrounding landscape is not frozen, is stream crossing and river crossing. So. Obviously, both of these can lead to problems, the biggest one being hypothermia, uh, but it's one of those scenarios that I just wanted to highlight because, um, especially in the spring, uh, this water is cold and fast and can cause um, all sorts of uh, injuries, including hypothermia. But you know, by the time you wade across a cold river, I, I did this once in Yellowstone National Park in June and the water temperatures were in the 40s and I got to the other side and my feet were completely numb and a few hundred yards later I was stumbling not because of hypothermia but because I had <laughs> numb feet and had lost coordination so um, yeah something to keep in mind that's kind of uh, important during the fringe seasons. Yeah for sure we actually just ran into this late fall hike in North Georgia uh, started out our day with a couple of pretty significant thigh high river crossings, and then it rained on us the whole rest of the day. Fifty degrees, forty five degrees. Uh, it was a it was a perfect storm of hypothermia scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. That's it right there. Well, Ryan, uh, let's just wrap it up by talking about a few of your favorite pieces of cold weather gear right now. Well, I'll start with my hands, and I think my my favorite piece of insurance gear for my hands is a, is a set of vapor barrier mitts. I have a set that's made by RBH Designs, and these are uh, fleece insulated. They have a sill nylon outer shell a le and a leather palm, but they have a vapor barrier liner in them. And the ability to just kind of pull these out of my pack and throw them on top of my regular gloves if my hands really start to get cold... I mean, within, again, 15 to 30 minutes, uh, my hands are usually recovered sufficiently where I can then take them off, restash them, and be good mm -hmm. to go. And it's a, it's a great insurance policy for extreme cold. The second thing that I've been experimenting with the last few years is an active insulation jacket that is made with highly breathable insulation and shell and lining fabric, something like the Patagonia Nano Air or Arcteryx Proton LT hoodie. And these garments have completely transformed how I hike in the winter because I can push pretty hard wearing these and not sweat to death like I would in, for example, a combination fleece and hard shell. So to me, that's one of the, the biggest advances in active winter insulation that's hit the market in the last few years. The... Other thing I am not shy about is taking a big fat down parka and pants so that I can put those on when I get into camp and prevent heat loss. And then the the other thing I really like is a pair of 40 below neoprene overboots that I can wear over my trail running shoes when I'm snowshoeing or spiking in extreme cold. And that has been a game changer for me because the feet are the most difficult part um, to stay warm for me. And so this allows me to like go snowshoeing in below zero conditions wearing trail running shoes. And it, it has been an absolute uh, game changer and, and uh, probably my favorite piece of winter gear. Yeah, I saw you playing around with overboots last year and it, it made me really jealous. Uh, a story about the Proton, you really can push hard in that thing. I'm playing with that jacket right now and I just uh, – we cut down a Christmas tree from the National Forest. We had a permit. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, roped that thing up and hauled it, you know, two miles back to the house. And I, that was a workout. No, right but, on, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, but the the moisture just went straight through that Proton LT jacket. Yeah, it's really interesting. They are a really interesting piece of uh, apparel layering. All right, so just to finish up, what are some of the best resources out there to learn more about cold-related diseases and how to treat them? In terms of cold-related illnesses specifically and wilderness emergencies in general, I highly recommend taking a National Outdoor Leadership Skill Wilderness First Aid course. This is a 16-hour course. It's usually taught over the span of a weekend and probably gives the best foundation for wilderness travel uh, first aid scenarios that I've ever uh, experienced. And then if you have the time and money and want to um, invest into a much higher skill set. The Wilderness First Responder course by Knowles is an outstanding program, and that's a that's a week long course that's definitely more engaging and more in depth, but gives you the skills you need to really manage wilderness emergencies as a trip leader. All right, well, Ryan, thanks for talking about this. Hopefully, this will help some people stay safe out there this winter. Awareness is the key to increasing your enjoyment and safety in the backcountry. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light Podcast. If you like what you heard or you have suggestions for different segments, let us know at podcast at backpackinglight.com. You can download the show notes for this episode by visiting backpackinglight.com slash podcast. This podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Leave us a review because it helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one party message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody.